me over. Anybody have any questions? Wow. Okay, one more week and we'll be going in reverse. Huh? <laughs> Is that what a Super Bowl Sunday? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I think I will. <laughs> At, uh, huh? That's right. For a change, I'd have a packed house. They, they wouldn't be here for me. Captive audience. It'd be like jail ministry all over again. Back when I was spiritual and used to do that kind of stuff. I was uh, 18, 19, 20. I was 21 years old when I went to Bible college and, uh, in, in uh, Southern California, in San Dimas, California. And we used to go out on weekends and do street ministry downtown Los Angeles. And uh, the first uh, prison ministry, the first prison we went into was Chino. And uh, I was, you know, I was like that tall and I weighed like 12 pounds, you know, I was 21 years old. And walking in a big, bad Bible, you know, Baptist little preacher. And we walked in and I remember hearing the doors behind me. I thought, wow, if something, if something goes down in here, it's going to take those guys like 40 minutes to get to me if they decide to. I'm talking about the, the guards. They, they can do an off, they, could, they could turn me into a lot of different kinds of tacos before the guards get to me. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah Chino was my first. Uh, uh, it wasn't so much going behind the locked doors, but when they went through my guitar case, I remember they, they, they cut guitar strings and they took capos. They took everything extra that I had. And uh, I, I was surprised they let me take the guitar in. I must have had that kind of look. You know, that I don't think we could let that kid take anything in. What made me think of that? Oh, captive audience, yeah, jail ministry. So were they captive audience? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. I think, I don't remember, I think, I think at Chino, we were, we were preaching to 200 at a time, 300. Huh? Really? Oh, Noah. Yeah, I think, I think it, was, it wasn't in the pods. It was in, in general out there somewhere. Here at BCDC, before they moved it up on the hill, uh, a lot of times they'd have us in the, was it the basketball court, I guess? They'd have us in the big area. I was, uh, I was with a friend. We were at, at BCDC uh, teaching, singing, and doing some stuff down there. And uh, I had done my thing, and my friend Steve was, was preaching. And I was sitting out there with the guys. There were, I don't know, 60 of us, maybe 60 of the guys and me, 60 of the residents. And uh, I, I was sitting, and I, I got pretty comfortable. I, was, you know, I wasn't on the edge of my seat, you know, all paranoid. I'd, I'd been there a couple times, and... These are guys that, that I was kind of familiar with, and I'm sitting there, and Steve is preaching, and and I, I, uh, it was like I was having some flashback, some, you know, Agent Orange flashback or something, just so you didn't think there was something else that I could have flashed back from. <clears throat> uh, anyway, I something the room was melting, the room was getting bigger, and I was getting smaller, and I thought, ah, oh, one of these guys put something in my something and I'm hallucinating and the room kept getting bigger and I kept getting smaller pretty soon I was flat on my back I was on those plastic patio chairs and I guess there's a load limit of like 600 pounds and I exceeded it <laughs> and the the chair didn't collapse it just kind of melted it. and I was the chair was falling in slow motion so I was on my back and all these guys you okay pastor Are you okay I'm fine yeah When I was at Chino or BCDC? Yeah, actually any place. But you're talking about when I was doing street preaching or jail ministry? And yeah, same thing. Yeah. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't as, as heavy warning people like I'm doing now. No. There it was, it was pretty general. And that's one of the reasons that I got frustrated and one of the reasons I quit doing jail ministry. One, uh, I was concerned for safety for my family because everybody who's involved in God's pot or everybody who was coming to the ministries wasn't there because they were looking to get closer to Jesus. Some of the guys just wanted out. You know, some of the guys are always looking for a, a way, you know, a way into somebody's life. Yeah. And uh, I was concerned about safety. I know God is bigger, but I, I got concerned for safety. At one point, uh, I think that this, the kicker was I took a group of, uh, of uh, I took a choir around Christmas time from our other church. And uh, I think that was the time, if I'm not mistaken, that we were on the, the basketball course. And I think there was an outdoor basketball court ups, outside at BCDC, so kind of on the roof. I, I, it's been a long time. I don't remember. And you guys are good to not, like, oh, yeah. No. <laughs> Nobody knows. I mean, but uh, 
uh, instead of taking us through a relatively safe place, because I had a bunch of ladies from the church and a bunch of us guys, and, and they took us through their, right, I mean, the guys are in their cells, they're in their living and their, what they do and live, and it's like walking through their bathrooms and stuff. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I mean, never mind just on a safety level, but the, the, I mean, what privacy, what modesty for our ladies and what privacy for the poor guys. And, and I just felt horrible about it. And, and I quit about that time. But uh, one of the main reasons that I quit doing jail ministry is because, I mean, there are like 400 preachers going in there during the week and on the weekends. And everyone is telling the truth. Well, we all don't believe the same thing. Most of the guys that were charismatic, uh, pretty heavy. Yeah, yeah. Most of those guys are pretty heavy, charismatic, and and uh, it, it wasn't my place to go in there. Me, the one guy with 400 other preachers, I'm the one guy who's going to go in there and tell everybody the truth. Yeah, uh, not not like I had it. Not like I have the corner on the truth, but I, I don't I don't buy into that. I think a lot of those guys, not not just guys because they're residents, but general population. I'm talking about out here. Uh, people are. I think people mean well. And I think that generally they have big hearts. I'm talking about people who, who will come to a, a ministry, whether in or out. Generally relatively trusting. And if somebody tells you that something is true, well, your first response is not that. Your first response is, is to trust. And, and I appreciate that. But uh, I, I disagreed with what most of the guys were teaching. It wasn't horrible. It just wasn't. How can people grow up? All they're doing is, is, is feeding the flesh. You know, you speak in tongues or you, or you get all frothy at the mouth and, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And I know what those guys are doing when they're not praise the Lord, praise the Lord, hallelujah, whether they're in God pod or not. You know, a lot of these guys are just, they're just takers, you know, they're just, not everybody, not everybody. But the guys who are on the up and up, they don't need me. They've, they've already got 400 other preachers coming in there. So I felt like I, was, I wasn't even a cog in the wheel. I was just one more, you know, here's this this rushing stream of water and I'm just one more little grain of sand you know what is my ministry not like God can't use one little but there was that and I felt like I was kind of swimming upstream because the the powers that be didn't want any kind of you know just kind of get along go along and that wasn't me so yeah I taught the same thing I just wasn't confrontational there so I was I wimped out yeah. If, if I thought that I would have had uh, people who would uh, listen, then of course I would have. Yeah. But uh, just like uh, whether, whether you're preaching a sermon you know, behind a pulpit or you're talking to a neighbor across the fence, uh, when you're ta talking to him about the Lord, you're, you're doing the same thing I'm doing. You exegete scripture. That means you, you don't try to push your pet, uh, you know, your hobby horses like preachers we get off on. Everybody thinks that my favorite thing is anti-casino, anti-drinking, anti-anything fun. You know, no tattoos, no piercings, just whatever you like or whatever you have. I'm against everything. Most people think that's just the way I am. That's not it. I'm just telling people, look, uh, the, the street signs that you see, wherever you're, you know, the street signs, the, 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 what you have in your life, they're just indicators of the direction that you're going. Whether you like it or don't like it, they're, they're just indicators of what you're comfortable with. You may not be comfortable with getting blitzed out, full-on alcoholic drunk, but you may be comfortable with a beer. Okay, fine. Well, it tells me what side of the street you're on. You know, I'm on the side of the street that doesn't do anything. No wine, no beer, no... I'm not saying you're a dirty, rotten sinner if you have a beer. I just think you're not very smart. Not as smart as the guys on my side of the street who can't get drunk unless somebody slips us something like I did at BCDC when my chair melted. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. Thank you, man. Um, but you're exegeting scripture. So instead of, instead of talking to your friend, uh, your family member, you're preaching your sermon, instead of just preaching all the stuff that you think is important, you want to take out of God's word and hand it to them. And, and that word ex, like exit, it's from the root to take out. When you exegete scripture, you're taking God's word and you're, you're handing, you're taking out, like you're scooping ice cream out of the, and you're handing it to somebody. You exegete. When you're talking to somebody, whether over the fence or preaching a sermon, you exegete scripture and you exegete your group so that you know what you're going to teach and you know who you're teaching. Because if I know what I'm teaching and I know who I'm teaching, that kind of determines how I'm going to deliver it. And I felt like I was fighting an uphill battle. 
Did I mix my metaphors? I felt like I was swimming upstream uh, for me to Judeo ministry because uh, I, 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 I didn't really understand the guys I was dealing with. I thought I did, but I, I didn't. Uh, not so much because they got caught and I didn't. No, it's not just, you know, the difference between them and us is we got caught and you didn't. No, that's not the difference between you and me. The difference is you did it and I didn't, you know. Uh, but there was a mindset with most of the guys who were there. Uh, I think good-hearted people, like a lot of people who come to church, um, they, 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 they're trusting and they trusted the wrong person. It's kind of like a woman who gets into a ton of trouble. I talked to a lot of ladies in, in, in jail uh, who were there because they wanted to please their man. Stupid. I think you should, babe. But generally, generally, that's not a good way to live. I mean, the Bible says submission is right. Submission is right. Submission is right. Women, why submit? Glory to God. Submit. Submit. But husbands don't like to know that the passage just before it, where it says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And then the one after that is wives are to submit to their husbands. The passage... Wives submit, the one before that, husbands love, the one before that, submit ye one to the other. So the passage that starts the whole thing is submit to each other. Husbands, it's going to look like not just taking a bullet for your wife, but picking up your socks and wash the dishes once in a while. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And wives submit. So it's not just wives submit, it's husbands submit too. It's, it's, it's a, yeah. I don't remember why I said that. How did I get there? Just do it, babe. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of ladies that I've talked to who were, who were just messed up, they got messed up because they were following a stupid guy. Uh, they made a, and, and they thought they were doing a good thing. Uh, guys, um, oh, guys were just stupid. The guys I talked to, they, they really were. They just, uh, 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 most of them uh, uh, gullible. You know, they were led by the wrong person. They were led by a buddy. They got involved in a gang. They, 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 they wanted to do something for their kids. I mean, I know of people who went to prison because they were really trying to do a good thing. They just did, a, did it stupidly. I mean, they stole to have something for their family. You know, I, I, my heart, I feel for them, but that doesn't justify it, you know. Um, but uh, once, once they get in there, I'm exegeting my group. And, and I got to tell you, everybody can't hear what I have to say. That sounds stupid, but you know, I mean, it is what it is. I'm actually reading scripture, but you know, the delivery system, there was a guy in here smoking in the church a while ago and he thought it was okay because it was just a nicotine delivery system. It's a wild cherry and gummy bear and right guard. I don't know what it was, but you know, it's only 15 bucks and it lasts me six months. It's just water vapor. Well, don't smoke in church. It's not smoke. I'm, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Why did I tell you that? <laughs> okay. Some people can't hear what I have to say. You know what I mean? Some people, they just can't hear it. My delivery system, that's what it was. I'm a delivery system. I'm not a cigarette. I'm more like that water vapor deliver, nicotine delivery system. I, I'm not blaming God. But let's just say for sake of discussion, God wants to use me like I am. I think he wants me to grow up and get better. But... The way I deliver truth is not the way you probably deliver truth. You know, you're probably nicer. You're probably more considerate. Uh, you're probably, uh, well, you're probably just nicer. I, I don't think I'm meaner. I just think I sense an urgency in a way that may border on unrealistic. You're I am that. Thank you. That's a compliment, right? Yeah. She said I'm blunt. Yeah, I sense an urgency, and, and I wanted to say on the edge of unrealistic because I don't think that the fact that I think most people don't sense the same urgency I do, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, I, I tend to be maybe, I, I don't think I'm unrealistic, but I'm trying to be generous. Yeah, Diego? We got into a preaching class here, huh? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I was, but with salvation. How was their reaction? Yeah, oh, good, positive. Yeah, positive. Just not, uh, not uh, anti or, or warning with charismatic. I wasn't so heavy on the warning, anti-charismatic warnings. But I was, yeah, I was the same with salvation and uh, getting saved and getting serious. I just avoided the soaked. You know, I just didn't talk a lot about it until you get into a church. A lot of those guys would get baptized in jail or in prison. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, I just think that a guy ought to be baptized in the church he's going to serve in. So it doesn't, doesn't always stick, but 
Okay, I don't know how we got there, but I love talking. Okay, page 133, if you have your books. Um, now, what's, what, is, what is the distinction, if, if you recall from John MacArthur's or from my teaching, is there a distinction between tongues as you find it in the Bible and tongues as you find it in charismatic churches today? Or is it the same? Huh? Different. It's different, isn't it? The tongues that you find in the Bible is what? A known language. So give me an example. English, Spanish, huh? Spanish, Spanish Chinese, French, Norwegian. Norwegian. Speak Norwegian, Norwegian. Lorni, Florni, Lorni, Florni. <laughs> tongues as you find in charismatic churches is what? Babel, gibberish. Well, he actually did it. Now, if one of you guys is smart, you'll have a, a word of knowledge and you'll tell me what he said, and it'll always involve me losing money. Go ahead. <laughs> that people were gifted with ways to talk to God? Yeah, that that's what tongues was? Yeah. Uh, uh, charismatics are taught that, that tongues is a, a holy hotline, so to speak, and it's an instant connection with God. Yeah, the cool thing is you don't even have to speak in English. In fact, uh, most of the time they run to a passage like uh, the passages in Romans where the Holy Spirit uh, sp uh, speaks in groanings, right? But it's the Holy Spirit who groans, not us. It's the Holy Spirit who speaks in something we don't even understand. It, it's not us speaking in a language we don't understand. Uh, and I don't understand what that means because the Holy Spirit doesn't have to go, oh, no, to God the Father. I, I don't even know what that means. Um, why do most charismatics believe that tongues is for today? There are two main reasons. You may have others, but what do you think I believe? What do you think I think? What are two of the main reasons that most charismatics believe that tongues, the, not the language, but the, the, the holy kind of language, that that's for today? Why do you think most charismatics believe? P-R-E-Y, pray, not like pray for, but pray on, take advantage of. Yeah, I, I wasn't even counting that one. Uh, there, there are a group of, of false teachers that will do anything to dupe, to take advantage of gullible, sensitive, big-hearted people. And, and I, I do believe that there are those at the top of big charismatic organizations who are praying on, taking advantage of. And I believe you can tell that. Look at, look at their lives. Uh, look at their sexual, uh, uh, not proclivities like homosexual or straight, I don't mean that, but um, do, they, do, they, do they seem like their lives are out of control sexually? Do they seem like their lives are out of control financially? Um, when you look in, in Jude, uh, uh, God has a lot to say about false teachers and what they're like, and they tend to prey on people in their churches. They take advantage of women, they take advantage of gullible, big-hearted people, and the end result, it really is a control thing. They control people, uh, money, yeah, stuff, yeah, but uh, the Bible has a lot to say about false teachers. Now, not all false teachers are going to be wildly out of control sexually and wildly out of control with his finances because a lot of charismatic churches aren't big enough to have that much money, really. Uh, but when they do get a buck, what do they do with it? You know, where do they spend it? Uh, uh, I guess you could, walk, you could look at my life and say, you're a false teacher. Uh, I've had, I've, someone recently called me a false prophet, called me a false teacher. Ouch. A little bit, a little bit ouch. A little bit ouch. Uh, and, and didn't come right out and say it was uh, financial indiscretion, more like financial stupidity. Well, yeah, duh, amen. I'll amen that. I don't really think that. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I look at a big picture, and I see what Lauren and I choose to do with, with the resources that God trusts us with. Uh, I don't own anything. I mean, it all belongs to God. I don't just, how spiritual for me to say that. I, I believe that. I don't believe that I, I possess anything that really belongs to me. My socks, my car, any money I have, my coffee, my coffee cup. You know, it, it all belongs to God. And I think I'm a good steward. And that actually makes me harder, not nicer. People would hear me say that and they would, why don't you give away more? Well, because you don't deserve more. Because they mean, why don't I give to them more? Does that make sense? So I think there are those who pray. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more on a, on a simple general level. People who are, you know, kind of on the up and up. Um, are people taught in charismatic churches? To speak in tongues or does it just happen 
of course, they're taught to speak in tongues. Expect it, practice it, prepare for it, look for it, pray for it, do it. It's okay, just start with blah, 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 sha, la, la, la. How again? Like that. <laughs> Pretty much like that. Um, I know, I'm making fun. Most charismatics who've experienced tongues, they weren't messing around. Uh, maybe it started kind of because in, in many, most charismatic churches, they're encouraged to just start with the nonsensical gibberish, but just trust God, and that will basically uh, prime the pump. You know, and then, and then God, the Holy Spirit, will loose your tongue. He'll loose your spirit, and, and it'll all flow. So, you know, in, in their defense, they're, you know, he's just mean. <clears throat> yeah, but I, I, I know I'm making, I'm making it sound like I'm, I'm mocking everything. But I think, it's, I think it's way too important. I think they're taught, and because they've experienced it. They've either experienced it personally, or they have someone in their life that they really trust or really love who's experienced it. And I either have to say I'm stupid or my loved one is stupid. Not that blunt, I'm blunt. But that's kind of what you're saying. I'm gullible or my loved one is gullible. And it's kind of hard to, to get to the place where you're saying my loved one is just kind of, that's a good, that's all. Yeah, I use that for a lot of things. This was just not smart. Yeah. 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 Right. And don't lose sight of the fact, right? He said that it, it, it's the only time you hear it in charismatic churches is in prayer or praise, never uh, conversation, right? Don't lose sight of the fact that tongues fits in there with healings and teaching and giving and encouraging, exhortation. All of those are spiritual gifts. Not one of those spiritual gifts was given to you for you. Not one of them. Every single spiritual gift that's given to you is given so that you have something to contribute to the health of the body, the church. It's not a personal language. It's not a prayer language. It's not a praise language. It was for the purpose of preaching the gospel to someone in the congregation who needed to hear it in that language. Now that we have this, I think that, that gift went away. Now that still requires some interpreters then, some you know, language, some linguists, somebody who knows English and Spanish, someone who knows English and German, someone who knows Swahili and Norwegian. Ouija. Yeah. Um, but the, the gift was for the church. Every spiritual gift was for the church, not for anything else. Okay, so tell me what you think about this. Uh, page 133. Pentecostal televangelist, self-acclaimed prophetess Juanita Bynum. You remember watching Juanita? I used to watch Juanita. Uh, preacher, a singer, a prophetess. Uh, I'd watch her. Uh, Juanita, uh, I think, got beat up by her preacher husband and then beat up her <coughs> preacher husband in a hotel parking lot. Uh, this is some years ago. Uh, the, their wedding was like bigger than Princess Di almost. It was huge in the in the charismatic world. TBN carried it. She wore this big old, as I recall, this big old, you know, gown, and the train filled the glory of the temple, and smoke rose up for uh, that's Isaiah six. But almost, it was a big old honking deal. And then her preacher husband ended up smacking her around. I think she beat him up. And then she uh, here not long ago said that, yeah, she was lesbian for a while. And wow, just crazy. But she had a hotline to God, Juanita did. Well, anyway, on Facebook in 2011, uh, page four on her Facebook page, I can't even say that. Mel could, if he could just read that. But basically she spoke in tongues in print. Can you speak in tongues with your keyboard? You know, okay, if you speak in tongues like this, how does it go, Mel, if I'm listening? Okay, if I'm speaking in tongues, can you speak in tongues with your fingers? I, I mean, guess you could. I do it all the time. Oh, darn it. Oh, darn it. Not the darn it one, but the, you know, I have like 17 thumbs when I type. So I'm a hunting pecker, but I'm fast. You know, with my two fingers. Yeah. I, I, I know where the keys are. I know my home keys. I know the, I just, I'm lazy. And I just got pretty fast, right? But when you trip over stuff, you know, I, I grew up watching my dad practice typing. He taught himself, I mean, he went to school, he taught himself architecture drafting. He taught himself uh, how, to, how to operate the, 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 the computer operated lathes at General Electric. And, you know, I, I, all my life, I watched my dad with uh, uh, technical manuals, 
teaching himself. Growing up, I, I remember watching him with a typing book. You remember typing books used to fold over the top? And he had a button and a string and a button, and he'd flip the book over, and the button and the button would hold the book up, right, open. And he would, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. J-K-L semicolon F-D-S-A. Yeah. Just from watching him, he my dad, my dad who loves to work on windmills and wood stoves, my dad, you know, callous is my dad. I watched him doing that. Now, when I do that, I'm speaking in tongues. I mean, it looks like it comes out like Juanita Bynum's. Is that tongues when I do that? When Skip, I bring this up all the time because I want people to know Calvary Chapel is a charismatic church. When, before Skip got saved, he said him and Gino used to, he and Gino used to go to Mexico and imbibe in whatever spirit that they did. And, and that they used to, they, used, they were involved in spirit writing where they would basically just take their pen out, pencil, and a piece of paper, and then just let demons, whatever, spirits, move their hand, and, and stuff came out. And he knew that was wrong. He, he knows now that's wrong. Well, now that he's charismatic and speaks in tongues, my question is, how do you know the difference? Charismatics tell me just because I know. Well, you thought you knew then. And you know you know now. How do you know? How do you know that this was not tongues? How do you know that spirit writing isn't the Holy Spirit? How do you know that the tongues you speak now isn't the unholy spirit? You can't know. This can't be judged. This skunarama, huma, huma, shuma, shuma, laba, laba. I'm actually pretty good at it. If I ever actually do it, I'm actually pretty good at it. I don't sound like yogi, dogi, bogi, bogi. I'm pretty good at it. I can out tongues Jimmy Swagger. Jump all the way down to the third line from the bottom, 133. Sometimes referred to as heavenly speech, the tongues of angels, private prayer language. Modern tongues consist of holy nonsensical babble, a point even charismatics acknowledge. Did you know that? Did you know charismatics call it babble? Or is it just that John MacArthur says that? Joyce Myers, down the uh, page 134. I know a lot of you love Joycey. She looks scary, bless her heart. Her Holy Spirit ought to give her a little more self-confidence. What is, what's happened to her face? You can only inject yourself and get so much plastic surgery. She looks like the Joker. I, I feel bad for her. Like Joan Rivers. Joan Rivers looks better. It's sad. It's sad. If you tell me that your Holy Spirit is bigger than my Holy Spirit, and I have more self-confidence, as messed up as my self-esteem is, and I have more self-confidence than she does, I mean, I'm, I'm considering a lot of crazy things, but not plastic surgery. I'd wear a bag over my head before I would do plastic surgery. Wow. Joyce Myers. I'm sorry, they'll get used to it. They'll get used to it, huh? Her face? My face. Oh. <laughs> we'll get used to it. <laughs> so page 134, second paragraph, about five lines down. Joyce Meyer. Joyce Meyer, after defending the modern phenomenon, tongues, merely because, quote, she says, there are millions of people on earth today doing it, she says, I doubt that many people are making up languages and spending their time talking in gibberish just for the sake of thinking they're speaking in tongues. Now, what did she call it? Yeah, the fake one she's calling gibberish, right? Because it sounds like gibberish. Jump down to the next paragraph. Linguists uh, who have studied modern glossolalia, glossolalia is, is, is the, the official term for tongues, right? Agree with that description after years of first-hand research, visiting charismatic groups in various countries, University of Toronto linguist professor uh, William Samarin, and, and uh, this professor is not the only one who's come to this conclusion. This is what he wrote. There is no mystery about speaking in tongues, about glossolalia. Tape-recorded samples are easy to obtain and analyze. You can find examples of people speaking in tongues everywhere. They always turn out to be the same thing. Strings of syllables made up of sounds taken from among those that the speaker knows. Linguists, people who study languages for a living, that's what they do. They study languages they know, they study languages they don't know. They listen for patterns, that's all language is. I mean, we have decided that coffee makes me happy when I hear the word. But it's just k a f e There's nothing inherently exciting about those syllables. K, k, I think that's with a K. K, k. No, it's a C. Tone. No, C goes C. No, this one's a k c okay, or whatever. But it goes k, k, and then ah, uh, ah, uh, and then f. None of those are ex 
especially that exciting to me. And then at the e, but put them all together, and those four sounds, k, uh, f, e. By the way, this is the way I learned how to read. Before I was in the first grade, I learned how to read. They taught me how to read phonetically, and so that I could read words that I'd never seen before. You just sound them out. That's what they said, sound it out. Well, I knew how to sound it out because I learned at home how to read phonetically before I started the first grade, before Mrs. Ducote thought I was the coolest kid in the first grade. Yeah, I learned how to spell k a f e k a f e k a f e k a f e k a f e k a f e No, k a f e coffee, coffee, coffee. Ooh, I got goosebumps. We decided that the sounds coffee represent this okay well we learned that we learned that right linguists analyze tongues modern day charismatic tongues always putting they tongues is always put together from sounds of k -a -f -e, from sounds that the speaker is familiar with someone speaking in charismatic tongues never sounds like someone speaking in tongues who is uh, from Norwegia. Yeah. Someone who would speak in tongues in German would sound like a German speaking in tongues. I don't know. You know check it out sometime. Um, but linguists say that. It's made up of sounds that the, that the speaker is familiar with. Not put together the way we were taught to put words together, but all right. Uh, they always turn out to be the same thing. Strings are syllable. If, if you ever listen to Jimmy Swagger, I, I teased about Jimmy Swagger. Listen to any of these guys speak in tongues. A and it's always the same little prattle. It's always the same little pattern. If you listen to them long enough, like I have, you pick up other little patterns. So pretty soon you can speak in tongues like Jimmy Swagger. You can speak in tongues like Joyce Meyer. You can speak in tongues like any of these guys. You listen to them long enough, it's the same little, little, little uh, uh, basket of sound. Made up of sounds taken from among all that the speaker knows, put together more or less haphazardly by which uh, nevertheless emerge as word-like and sentence-like units because of realistic language-like rhythm and melody. Uh, language has a cadence, you know, like riding a horse. And you can ride a, if the horse is trotting, you can ride it like a sack of potatoes. Or you can, you know, when it's galloping, you just, you, you just kind of roll with the horse. You just kind of, people speaking in tongues when they're familiar with it, at first, and then after a while, they're just kind of riding with it. But it's not because it's a language. It's because they're just familiar with those sounds. This, these guys say, again, there are people in this church who say, I'm still full of it, and I'm doing more harm than good. Uh, last two sentences on 134. Glossolalia is not a supernatural phenomenon. In fact, anybody could produce tongues if he's uninhibited and discovers what the trick is. Uh, let's just uh, skip over. I'm not going to teach you what the trick is. 136, does the modern version of tongues match the biblical gift? Middle of the page. Charismatics claim that their tongues experience makes them feel closer to God. A typical testimony from a charismatic parishioner proclaims, for me, it's almost as if I'm able to tap into God's heart and what He wants. I don't really know what I'm saying, but I know it is what God wants me to say and speak. It is more of an enlightenment. You can feel Him all around you, and you can feel Him speaking through the words you are saying. That sounds like what every charismatic has ever told me, and that sounds exactly like, well, de demonic influence. If I want to, if I want to, if I want to, uh, uh, if I want to get you into my cult, if if, if I want you, if I want to trick you, if I want to beguile you, if I want to, am I? Am, a lot of cult leaders are uh, blunt. They're harsh. They're, you know how I am. They're, uh, they're. Uh, well, a lot of that is, is, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about cult leaders. A lot of that is, is kind of like a boot camp, you know, drill sergeant. There's a lot of, there are a lot of barriers to be broken down because we have a lot of self-defense mechanisms. Once you break through a lot of those barriers and you get a person to believe you and you find out that what you say they'll actually believe and they'll actually do, <laughs> you guys are safe. I've watched you. It, 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 it's not that difficult then for someone who wants to take advantage of somebody to say just the right things. And even though the person might feel ugh by the ugh, the, uh, the, the, the stark ugh of the leader, of the cult leader, of the, of the preacher, something about it makes them feel good. I've had people say, man, you stepped, not here, most of the other church, they say things like, boy, you stepped all over our toes today, preacher. Boy, that was good. 
I don't feel good when I get yelled at. Do you? Really? When the boss chews you out, you like that? I don't like it. I never liked it. Now, it's, it's one thing to be corrected. I, I don't mean you have to correct me a certain way. It's one thing to, you know, what you did was stupid. Do, do it this way. A la mori, how stupid am I? I didn't see that. Thank you. Right? But it's quite another thing to develop a group of people who actually feel good because you make them feel bad. That's, that's I mean, me saying it here, you, you see that, right? Why would a person accept something like that? But somehow in these groups, this, this experience makes them feel better. I was watching yesterday a, a, a group of people who go throughout uh, uh, African communities, uh, villages, African villages. And they put on this, uh, uh, well, basically what happens is this uh, medicine man, this faith healer, this medicine man comes out uh, dressed in, in, in India. I say Africa, Indian, Indian communities, India. He goes out into these communities and uh, uh, he does some uh, stuff. Uh, he, he makes uh, 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 soot, ash, ashes. He makes soot magically appear. He makes water appear. Uh, he makes uh, their currency, he makes uh, currency appear out of thin air. Uh, someone from the crowd uh, invariably has some, something they need to be prayed for. He, he's a, he's a uh, uh, he, uh, medicine, religious man. Uh, invariably somebody in the crowd has been demonized somehow. They're, they're struggling with nightmares, they're having this, they're having that. He casts the demon out of, usually it's a young lady. He casts the demon out of this person. He takes the demon and he puts it in a, a coconut. He, he carries uh, coconuts. This is Indian villages. He takes the demon out of, generally it's a young lady. The demon goes into this coconut. He exercises, the demon makes it go into the coconut. He proves that the demon's in there. He does something and smoke comes out of the coconut. Uh, he, uh, before he does the fire, when the demon comes out of the young lady and goes into the coconut, he sets the coconut down, and in a minute the coconut moves it, with a demon in it. He prays, and holy water and smoke and fire comes out of the coconut. Um, uh, another time, the demon will go into the coconut, he'll set it down, and the demon will make the coconut move. He'll cast the demon from that coconut into the holy magic coconut, and after he chamuscas it, he'll break the coconut and blood will come out of the coconut from the demon. And then uh, invariably the, the medicine man's assistant will go to the dad of the young lady who, who had the demon cast out of her, will arrange for a suitable payment. And then the magic man will promise similar uh, magic religious, spiritual feats for a price. And then someone, uh, uh, a foreigner in the crowd who's watching all this will say, hey, 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 and he'll challenge the medicine man and they get into this big old ruckus, come to find out that the medicine man is, a, uh, in the video I was watching yesterday, is a bank manager and this group is kind of like a traveling, not a comedy group, but a traveling group. They go around to small villages in India teaching people don't trust these medicine men. They're taking advantage of you. He shows them that the, the demon in the coconut that makes it move, he opens the kind of glued together coconut. There's a little mouse inside a little coconut. And when you put the coconut down, the mouse is moving around and it looks like, oh, there's a demon making that coconut move. Uh, the demon possessed girl, it's somebody in the group. Uh, the blood in the coconut is a special coconut. The fire, it's you know, something in the, and, and he's teaching them, don't believe these magic men. Don't, don't believe this stuff. Don't believe this stuff. But invariably, one of the things that character, char, that's characteristic of, of charismatic groups and, and cults, and, and this is one of the reasons I'm waving the flag, is because there's so many similarities, it makes them feel close to their God. Now, if the experiences in a false religion or a cult, and in a Christian, Bible-teaching, charismatic church, if they're all similar, shouldn't that freak you out a little bit? Shouldn't that make a red flag go up for you without me having to wave the red flag? What you teach, what you believe, what you do should be radically different from a cult, should be radically different from a, a, a false religion. You know what I mean? This stuff sounds too... Uh, too similar. And to say, well, I know it. Uh, what was I reading? Was it 136? 
It, for me, it's almost as if I'm able to tap into God's heart and what he wants. I don't really know what I'm saying. Stop. Well, how do you know you're not conjuring up demons? I tell you that when, my, when Tyler was little, I wouldn't let him sing Akuda Matara. I wouldn't let him sing that, uh, uh, what was that from, Lion King? I wouldn't let him sing that song. In fact, I probably conjured up a demon when I said that right now. How do you know what you're saying? And, and especially if it's a, from Walt Disney. Heaven only knows what they're teaching kids to say, you know? Uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating by a whole lot. You don't know what, what, you don't know what they're saying. You don't know what they're saying. I don't know so much about conjuring up demons, but just the fact that, that someone convinced you to say words and sounds that you don't know, and it makes you feel good, and I don't know what I'm saying, but I know it's what God wants me to say and what He wants me to speak. How do they know this? I've had people in this church tell me that. How do they know? What's your standard? Can't be this. They're telling me that their standard is how they feel. How is Satan going to deceive the very elect? Yeah, with that kind of stuff, your feelings, your fears, something that you think is faith, and, it, and it's not faith. I don't know what I'm really saying, but I know it's what God wants me to say and speak. It's more of an enlightenment. Remember I told you in the early church, the Gnostics were people who said, you know, we, we believe the God's Word too, we believe the Bible too, but we actually have special revelation from the Lord. Well, isn't that what charismatics say today? God spoke to me today. God told me, I know He wants me to do this. I know He wants me to do that. I know He wants me to buy this thing from there. I know He wants me to not do that thing. Not because the Bible says don't, but because they just know it in their knower. That's silliness. That's, that's childishness. You teach your kids not to be gullible, but somehow if they're in a charismatic church, then it's spiritual. Where, where does it cross over from gullible to spiritual? I don't think it does, right? So again, uh, one of the main reasons for waiting is because so many of us have, have, have come out of or still involved with uh, charismatic churches, charismatic ministries, and it, my thing is not to make you feel bad, although that, I, that makes me happy personally to make you feel uncomfortable. But that's not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I want you to think about your faith. If you're a dyed-in-the-wool Baptist, I'm going to pull a rug out from under you, too. Yes, sir? You know, I've, I've said this before here, too, that, you know, we're kind of taught to just step out of faith yeah. and not question it. But, you know, when I used to shy at times, and I, I did, we went to charismatic. You did? Get out. <laughs> anyway, but, but I never bought it. You know what I mean? Huh. You did it. You were taught to do it. You did it, but you never really bought it. The doubt, the... So, so why do, why do you think that? I, and I, uh, maybe I'm speaking out of out of school here. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe I'm taking what you're saying to too much of an extreme. It seems to me that there are many people in charismatic churches who did speak in tongues. They did get slain in the spirit, and they never really bought it. And if that's true, why why would people in charismatic churches do it if they really don't? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So So, and so they're, they're faking it or they're not actually faking it? They just want to do it so bad? Or? Yeah. 
sinner. You wouldn't fall back. And he wanted you to. Rebel. <laughs> I bet that was something to see. Yeah. Yeah. And and if not more more important, at very least a part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who wants to be the oddball? Yeah. Who wants to be the weird one? Who doesn't have it? If you can have it, yeah. Oh. I don't know. I was looking at both of you I'm with my three eyes. <laughs> I realize that was a little confusing when I'm looking at this one and that one starts talking to the <laughs> You just, you, yeah. And you should be able to trust yes. those in authority over you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You accept what they're what they're teaching you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because you don't know what you're saying. Yeah. And you're being sensitive to not question the authority. Yeah. Yeah. Heather? Yes, I'm looking at you. Desperation. Yeah. But hold up. Let, let Heather finish. She'll hit you. I've seen her. Yeah, she gets crazy. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I I think you're right. I think desperation is a big big part of it. Arguing in tongues, nice. How could you tell that? They were, but do they know what they were saying to each other? I mean, so they weren't happy. You could tell they were angry, <laughs> and in tongues, a la modi. They said they were. Now that glorified the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah, that would glorify the Holy Spirit because you can't speak in tongues unless you're being, unless you're baptized in the Holy Spirit right then. And they were arguing in tongues. <laughs> yeah, a normal part of life. Yeah, one thirty-six. Uh, last two uh, sentences. In reality, the modern expression of glossolalia are deceptive, dangerous, only offering a pretense of genuine spirituality. Charismatics may claim it is God speaking through them. But there is absolutely no evidence to confirm the notion that modern glossolalia comes from the Holy Spirit or helps in His work of producing holiness. Stop. That is the main reason I do not believe in tongues for today. It's not that I haven't experienced it. It's not that I'm a Baptist. It's not that I just don't understand the working of the Holy Ghost. I, I understand enough of this to know that the Holy Spirit's primary purpose is to do what I just read. And that is to bring people to salvation and to carry out this work of sanctification. I read, charismatics may claim that it's God speaking through them, but there's no evidence to confirm that notion. There's nothing to confirm to me that anybody that I've ever talked to who speaks in tongues or spoke in tongues, uh, I, I'm not slamming y'all if you've ever done it, I'm just saying that people who tell me today that they still do, there is no evidence to confirm that modern tongues is coming from the Holy Spirit or is helping in their work of holiness. I don't know one person, 
I doubt that they're listening. I wish they were. I wish they were here. I don't know one person who says they speak in tongues today who is growing in holiness. I don't know one. Now, generally, I wouldn't be so ungracious and say bunch of sinners. I don't know one of you that's growing. Uh, but you know my position. If you tell me your Holy Ghost is bigger than my Holy Ghost, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. And if you tell me you're more spiritual than I am, and I can see the holes in your theology, I can see the, you know, the, the problems with what you believe and what you're doing, then I can tell there's a problem with it. You know what I mean? I can tell that this isn't, this isn't the Holy Spirit. This isn't kosher. Yeah? If, if, if they're arguing in tongues, well, you know it's not tongues. You know it's not the Holy Spirit. Arguing, the Bible tells us not to be involved in that kind of... Now, I, I mean, there's a, there's a place for disagreeing. And shoot, I can ar argue Jimmy Swaggart there too. But you know what I'm saying. The, 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 the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and self-control and all the other manifestations of that fruit, right? There is no evidence that this is coming from the Holy Spirit and no evidence that this is producing holiness. I don't know one person who tells me that they're still speaking in tongues today who is becoming more godly. I don't know one. And I'm sure they would say, Tony, well, Tony, you don't know everything in my life. I don't have to know everything in your life. I just see the stuff that's out front. And if I can't see growth and holiness in the stuff I see, you know, what did Jesus say to the guy that they dropped through the roof in Mark chapter 2? Is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or get up, take your mat, and walk home? But so that you know that the Son of God has the power to forgive sins on the earth. Hey, dude, pick up your mat, walk, and go home. <gasps> and they saw him do it. Because if Jesus said, hey, your sins are forgiven, that's, nobody can see that. I mean, and he did it. He forgave sins. But nobody can see that. But I can see if you are paralyzed, and then all of a sudden, your, your body is energized, and you can take up your mat and walk home. If the Holy Spirit is really at work in your life, modern-day charismatics, how come I don't see you growing in holiness? Why don't I see you becoming more like Jesus? If anything, I see more arrogance and feeding of the flesh. Now, that's blunt. That's ungenerous of me. Is that a word, ungenerous? I don't. I don't know one. I don't know one person who tells me that they're still flat out charismatic that isn't feeding the flesh with their stuff and not growing in holiness. Conversely, there are very good reasons to avoid the practice. It is, in fact, a common practice in numerous cult groups and false religions, from the voodoo doctors of Africa to the mystic monks of Buddhism to the founders of Mormonism. So I don't think I want to speak in tongues. 138. Third paragraph down. The only detailed description of the true gift of tongues in Scripture is Acts chapter 2, and it clearly identifies the gift as a supernatural ability to speak a genuine, meaningful, translatable language. Right? Uh, let's jump all the way over to 143. Common questions. So what was the purpose of the gift of languages? Third line down, primarily demonstrated transition. Uh, uh, it, was, it was demonstrated that a transition was taking place from the Old Covenant to the New, the Old Testament to the New Testament, were shifting gears, and as such it served as a sign to unbelieving Israel. So tongues, tongues was a little different. The miraculous sign gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues, healings, and miracles. Those four gifts of tongues, was that Phil? It looked like Phil out there. The, the four miraculous sign gifts were miraculous sign gifts. They were to authenticate the messenger and the message. And once the Bible was completed, there was no reason for those gifts anymore. That part of the sign gift. Beyond that, they were also spiritual gifts that were for the church. So they kind of served a dual function. Those four kind of served a dual function. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, healings, and miracles. They were to authenticate the preacher and his message. And then after that, uh, to, to build up the body of Christ, okay? Um, about the middle of that uh, paragraph, uh, that chunk on the right-hand side, the ending of Mark's gospel uh, explains that the disciples of Christ would speak in language that were new to them, which would be one of the signs that authenticated them as messengers of the true gospel. The secondary purpose for the church was the edification of fellow believers, right? So it was given by the Holy Spirit uh, for the building up of others within the body of Christ, 144. When used outside the church, the gift of languages was a sign that authenticated the gospel as demonstrated on the day of Pentecost. When used in the church, it was for the edification, edification of other believers. Uh, the gift provided another way. Before the New Testament was completed, for God to reveal the truth to His church, like prophecy with the added impact of a linguistic miracle to authenticate it. So tongues 
uh, basically worked hand in hand with prophecy, with uh, teaching the truth. Not prophecy like you see in charismatic churches today, but speaking forth, bluntly, boldly, courageously speaking forth the truth. That speaking forth the truth from God with the added benefit that it was in a language that the speaker didn't know. But there was no reason to speak in tongues without the revelation and the forceful, confident forth-telling. They received from God and they confidently spoke in another language. So there was no purpose for the tongues without the revelation from God and the forthfully telling the truth. Does that make sense? Okay. So tongues today, it's, it's none of those. It's just, it makes me feel good. I don't know what I'm saying, but I know God likes it. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? You don't know. You don't know. I just know. No, you don't. Bottom of 144. Were all believers expected to speak in tongues? Many charismatics, especially those influenced by classic Pentecostalism, and there's a little distinction between Pentecostals and charismatics, not much, have insisted that all Christians should speak in tongues, arguing it's the initial and universal evidence of baptism by the Holy Spirit. But the Pentecostal para paradigm is shattered by Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 12. In verse 13, it's made clear that if all of his readers, as believers, had experienced the spirit baptism at the moment of salvation. So everybody that he's speaking to had already been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, yet the ensuing verses, he explained that not every one of them had been given the gift of languages. So if everybody he was preaching to, and this is not just some preacher, this is Paul speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, all of you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, but all of you didn't speak in tongues. So why would modern-day Pentecostals or Charismatics say that tongues is the evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Because that's the way they put the pieces together. That's the way they built their theology. And it could be as simple as I build my theology a different way. A theology remembers uh, 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 the science of theos, God. It's the, it's the science of God or the study of God, theology. You have a systematic theology. You have a bunch of, you have a bucket of Bible knowledge in your head. When you decide to pull stuff out, of, do you have a five gallon bucket in your backyard somewhere that's got nails and screws and widgets and brackets and pieces of can and you know, I mean, everybody who's anybody has got one. You dump that thing out, you're looking for a screw, you're looking for a nail, you're looking for a bolt, I think it's over there, and you dump that thing out. You don't pull everything out, you, you pull out the thing you need. You have a bucket of knowledge in your head. And when you pull stuff out, that's one thing. When you pull stuff out and put it together with other stuff, now you're building a system. With the bucket of Bible knowledge you have in your head, you pull things out and you put them together the way it makes sense to you. That is a systematic theology. I spend lots of money on systematic theology books. You have a systematic theology. It may be accurate. It may be not close to the truth, but you have a systematic theology. You have a bucket of Bible knowledge in your head. And when you pull stuff out and put stuff together, you're building a systematic theology. Does that make sense? People build their systematic theology based on a lot of stuff. People get their theology from movies. They get their theology from TV. They get their theology from old wives' tales. Uh, how much theology comes out of the Bible? Well, not as much as they'd like to think. Most of us believe what our preachers told us. I'm still, I've been saved, what did I say this morning, 41 years? I'm still discovering things that I truth. Uh, I'm still discovering that I'm preaching things that I believe to be truth. I believe it with all my heart. It's not in the Bible. It just got so ingrained from my, from my Baptist preacher. They're not bad things. They're not, you know, they're just, this is not in the Bible. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see verses in my mind. I'll see verses and I'll know what book they're in. And I'll flip through. Like, Where the heck is that verse? Did I make that verse up? Sometimes I've made up verses. So I shouldn't admit this to you. Sometimes I'll flip through and I know that verse is there. And I can't find it. I know where it is. It's on the right-hand side of 1 Corinthians, about three pages. I know where it is. And Lauren will, you know, she just knows it, Google. She just finds it like that. You know, I'm, and it's not just that I'm getting old. I really believe those passages were there. We believe a lot of stuff with all our heart. It ain't there. I'm tugging on your spiritual rug. It doesn't matter where you are. I'm going to tug on your rug. And if you're fine, cool. And if you're gullible, well, get off that rug and get on another rug. Get on the floor because I'm going to keep pulling on the rug. Yeah? Um, jump all the way down to are we all uh, expected to speak in tongues, 144. 
Um, actually, that was what I just read, right? Uh, jump over to 146. Page 146, did Paul command the Corinthians to desire the gift of tongues? Go all the way to the bottom, the very last line. Motivated by pride and selfish ambition, the Corinthians sought to acquire and display the most ostentatious, manifestly miraculous spiritual gifts. They didn't pray for the gift of giving. They prayed for tongues. Father, the preacher out and said, pray for the gift of giving. Ushers, come on. They coveted the applause of men desiring to appear spiritual when in fact they were operating in the flesh. It is, that's another reason that I have a hard time, that I just don't believe. I just don't buy. And it doesn't matter what I believe. I'm telling you, in, in my knower, you know, in their knower, they know they're speaking to God. In my knower, I know they are so not because I see the other decisions they're making. They are operating in the flesh. They're doing something that feeds their flesh, makes them feel better makes them feel better about themselves, makes them feel better about the group they're with, makes them feel better about the relationship with God. And in the absence of true spiritual growth, in the absence of true spiritual holiness, they substitute true spiritual growth with supernatural manifestations that aren't real. And you can chew on that. You don't have to believe that, but it's true. Next time you talk to somebody who's so full of the Holy Ghost, hold their feet to the fire, watch them, listen to them. I've never talked to one full out <laughs> baptized in the Holy Ghost charismatic that doesn't say bad words ever. I have never talked to a full out, I'm washed in the blood of Jesus and I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. I've never talked to one who doesn't drink ever. Uh, maybe I have, but I don't know of any. They all think it's okay. They love their Christian liberty. Every one of them dances. Now, you know, I, there's not a thou shalt not dance. When you have a daughter and she, some little boy is grinding up against her, you can see that's a problem, can't you? Or is it okay if they call it dancing? Oh, you know that's a problem. When is it okay? Well, when they're 14. Really? Okay, when they're 18. No, it's still not okay. And I don't want your husband doing that either. Okay, maybe, you know. At some point, okay, your husband and your wife and knock yourself out. Yeah, I guess husbands and wives can dance. We used to argue about this one all the time, Lauren and I. Yeah, I guess husbands and wives can dance. I'm stopping right there. <laughs> you know that you don't want some little boy doing something with your little girl. I mean, at what point? Well, they're not sleeping together. Well, what are they doing together? I mean, when, at what point? I don't, uh, dancing in my mind, maybe I'm just a dirty old man, dancing in my mind is not in the same category as movies and TV. Dancing is on the continuum of making out. You meet somebody, at some point you talk to them, at some point you hold hands, at some point you kiss, at some point you're making babies. Dancing is on that continuum to me. Dancing is not on the going to the movies and watching TV. You don't have to buy it, you don't have to believe it. When it's your little girl, then it makes sense. No. I think we ought to protect our little girls. And I don't think it's okay. I don't think it's okay for little boys to do whatever they want to in the name of dancing. I don't. I just, it's not. Knock yourself out after you're married. Dance the night away with your husband. Now, I've watched 70, 80, 90-year-old men picking out the young girls to dance with at their parties. Why? Because they're spry? Because they're just happy? That's what they told me. I'm just happy. I'm celebrating. What, you dirty dog? Go celebrate with an old woman. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? A dirty old man. Because it's okay. It's acceptable. No, it's not. <sighs> How in the world could I get thou shalt not dance? It's not in the Bible. I found it in this book. I have never talked to a full out, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost person who didn't think all of those fleshly, flesh, fleshly things, dancing, uh, 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 drinking, uh, cussing, they justify it. You know, I know I shouldn't. Or, well, you know, we decide what's a cuss word. It's not, they're just sounds. Well, why did you pick those sounds? Why don't you pick the sound I make? <clears throat> That's bad enough. <clears throat> Why do you have to do the sound that everybody recognizes as a cuss word? You know what I mean? So if you have family and friends who are just 
baptized in the Holy Ghost. Watch them. And the next time they say a bad word, call them on it. And the next time they want to go do something of the flesh, call them on it. Ah, you don't have to. I don't care. But I'm saying that's an indicator that they're not. It's an indicator. If they lack discretion, if they're dumber, or at least not any smarter, that's an indicator that they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. If they're more gullible, that's an indicator that they're not growing. Now, some of us are limited. I understand that. I don't have the firepower that most of you do. I understand we have intellectual and emotional limitations. I get that. But someone who's baptized in the Holy Spirit, yeah, I'm not giving them any more hope. Thank you. Someone who tells you that they're, thank you, baby, baptized in the Holy Spirit, if they're just as gullible now as they were before, that is an indicator they are not baptized by the guider, by the true light, by the, by the true light, the Holy Spirit. If they're just as dumb as a bag of rocks now as they were before they got baptized in the Holy Ghost, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't make you more gullible. He makes you sharper. He makes you stronger. Does that make sense? Yeah. Dave? Will you just amen me, brother? Oh, none of the above are correct. Uh, 147, what are the tongues of angels? Charismatics often point to Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 13 where he mentions angelic tongues. Invariably, they want to claim the gibberish we hear in charismatic glossolalia is otherworldly tongues, some sort of holy heavenly language that transcends human conversation and belongs to the discourse of angels. By the way, I'm not just saying this to butter you up because you're here. I'm telling you that the fact that you're here thank you, speaks uh, volumes about your willingness to be stretched. I know you guys. We've talked. We've disagreed on things. You, you guys were here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm not just, hey, you're here. So. The gold star. This is not gold star. I'm telling you the fact that you know what you know and you believe what you believe and you know what I believe and you know what I'm teaching and you're still here to, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll consider this. I'll hear this. And you, 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 you're stretched. When you go away, you know I want you to believe this, right? Not my interpret interpretation. I can't even say the word. Not my interpretation of the Bible. I want you to believe the Bible. I hope I'm giving you more ammunition. I hope I'm giving you more tools. I hope I'm sharpening your plow or sharpening your sword. I almost said plowing with your heifer. That's the other, that's not the one I want to do. I hope that what I'm doing is sharpening your axe, sharpening your sword, sharpening your whatever you're using in, in living your life for Jesus. And if you go out of this study and you, and you still believe stuff that, that's not, I mean, I think he's a little extreme. I think McCarthy, he's a little extreme for me. If, if you don't buy it, that's fine. I, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I just want you to grow from where you are. I want to grow from where I am. Does that make sense? I, and I, it just speaks volumes that you know and you're still here. Uh, the tongues of angels, uh, all the way down to the bottom of 147 five lines up from the bottom. Ironically, charismatics often focus so intently on the phrase tongues of angels, they miss Paul's real point. Any selfish use of this gift violated its true purpose, namely that it is to be exercised in an expression of loving edification for other believers. Others are not edified by the mere spectacle of someone speaking in tongues. I've had people tell me they speak in tongues in here. Well, you know I would stop someone who's speaking in tongues in here. So they tell me they speak in tongues to themselves. You know what that is? That's poking me in the spiritual chest. Uh, what, you know my concern for you. If you have a drink, you can get drunk. And for someone to brag to me that they drink, I know the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not drink, but, but for me to be so concerned about it and for that person not just to keep it to themselves. You have enough sense to not tell me everything. You know, I imagine enough stuff. You don't have to tell me what's going on in your life. But someone who tells me I do. I do that. That is so not, I mean, it's not like it bothers me. Like, you shouldn't. Well, I do. Well, you shouldn't. You know, I'm not going to get into a peeing contest with them. But that just is indicative of the fact that they are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and if they really see me as the weaker brother, 
I have a problem with drinking, or I have a problem with dancing, or I have a problem with going to the casino. If I really am the weaker brother who just hasn't learned to grow up and enjoy and, and uh, embrace my Christian liberty, they're not supposed to rub their Christian liberty in my face as a weaker brother. Okay, fine, if you've got it together and you can drink and smoke and cuss and grind on somebody you're not married to, in Jesus' name, knock yourself out. I don't think you can, but if you can, and if you're really filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to rub it in my face. You know that will violate my conscience. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying don't tell me, keep it from me. And I'm not telling you to tell me because it'll break my heart. What I'm saying is look for indicators. What does it look like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm telling you it doesn't look like what most of us have been taught by TV preachers and charismatic churches. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. I mean, that's not it. But if you need a verse... That's a good a verse. And you're going to find that it's more restricting than it is liberating. But the cool thing is you don't have to do that verse. It's the fruit of the Spirit. If I'm an apple tree, I don't have to make myself do apples. Uh, 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 help me out here. Uh, uh. <laughs> Not yet. Come on. Uh. That was me making, I don't know what that looked like. If I'm an apple tree and I'm healthy, guess what's going to pop out of me? Boop! Apple. Galatians 5.22 is not the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. One fruit manifests itself. Love. More kindness. More gentleness. Selflessness. Yeah? You know what I mean? If a person tells you they're full of the Holy Spirit, if you think you're full of the Holy Spirit and you're not manifesting that fruit, well, you, you're just not. That's why I know that most of the time I'm not. Uh, I'm not confessing. I'm just I'm sharing with you here. You know, you, you can know when I'm so urgently trying to lead somebody to the Lord, trying to share my faith with them, and I feel these veins pop out, I know that's not the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I care. I am passionate. I so do not want them to go to hell. And I'll, I'll get into it, man. I'll, and I'm leaning forward, and this vein's popping, and that vein's popping, and I'm just, I'm full of it, but I'm not full of the Holy Spirit right then. Because it doesn't depend on my passion. It doesn't depend on my sense of urgency. And that's where guys like me mess up in our sermons, in our sermonizing, in our preaching of sermons, in our talks. We feel the, 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 the responsibility before the Lord. I sense the urgency. I have the concern. The compassion that I have for you comes out in a passion that often sounds, what were those kind words, blunt? Uh, and I'm not justifying it. I'm just telling you I get it, and I wish I got it more. But because it's the fruit of the Spirit, I shouldn't have to make myself be nicer, and I, I'm working on it. But we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. I don't have to make myself be more apple-y. Do I look more apple-y now? How about now? If I'm an apple tree and I'm healthy, I'm just going to make apples. If I'm really filled with the Holy Spirit, I don't have to work at it. I just will manifest the fruit of the Spirit. I just will. I won't brag about it. I won't talk about me less. I won't talk about me at all. You'll see it. You'll see it before I see it. And no one's come to tell me they've seen it, so I'm, I ain't there yet. No, you're not going to tell me. But I'll see it in you. You know what I mean? It, we we kind of we kind of kind of feed off each other. Uh, what did Paul mean? One forty-nine. Am I making any sense at all? You don't have to buy everything I'm saying, but not really. Am I more confusing than one forty-nine? Last two verses. Uh, last two lines. What did Paul mean when he said, "Tongue speakers speak to God, not to men"? I've had people tell me that too. Well, you just don't understand, Tony. I'm just speaking to God not to men. But I'm... Charismatics sometimes cling to that phrase, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, as justification for their unintelligible glossolalia. Once again, the context belies that interpretation. The entirety of the verses read as follows. Pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So what's more important here in, in his? Well, love and prophecy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, it says, for uh, no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. In those verses, Paul was not extolling the gift of tongues. Rather, he was explaining why it was inferior 
to the gift of prophecy. Whereas prophecy was spoken in words that everyone could understand, the gift of foreign languages had to be interpreted in order for others to be edified. Paul defined exactly what he meant by the phrase, does not speak to men but to God, in the very next line because no one understands. If the language were not translated, only God would know what is being said. I don't know if you buy that, but that's, that's MacArthur's uh, response to that. Basically, he's saying, if I have the gift, uh, the spiritual gift of speaking in German, and I can't speak German, I can say, ja, das ist gut. That's it. I don't even know if that's German, but it sounded harsh, so it passes. If I don't know how to speak German, God gives me the spiritual gift of being able to speak in German, and no one here needs to hear it in German, what am I supposed to do with my spiritual gift? Nothing right then. Keep it to myself. Because if I speak it, I, nobody understands it but me and God. I mean, dude, why are you talking in German? Nobody understands what you're saying but you and God. You're only talking to God. That's all Paul is saying. He's not saying, if you speak in tongues, it's okay because you're just talking to God. He's saying, dude, what are you doing? You just talk, nobody understands but you and God. There's a, there's a of sarcasm there, an edge of sarcasm there in what he's saying. Uh, again, you don't have to buy it. The passages are, uh, admittedly, they're a little, wow, what did he mean there? The starting point should always be, it's a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts are given to you for someone else, not for you to use on you. Spiritual gift, it is a spiritual gift. It's to be used for the health of the body. Yeah. Well, I think spiritual gift, not for you, for the health of the body. So that kind of does away with prayer language, praise language, personal language. I don't know what a lot of these verses mean. Uh, that one kind of left me a little empty, his explanation. I, I mean, I get it, I understand it, but I don't know that it's all that satisfying. But a spiritual gift is from God as He chooses. It's not for you to pray for and get whatever you want. He gives them. As the Holy Spirit gives severally, the Bible says. He gives it. If He gives it to you, it's not for you. It's for the health of the body and should be done in the church. Um, what about praying in tongues? First, um, uh, 150, right in the middle. Uh, Paul mentioned the gift of tongues was used in public prayer for the purpose of edification. Charismatics, however, have tried to redefine the gift of tongues as a special mode of supernatural expression for personal devotions and private prayers. But notice how different Paul's description is from that of modern-day tongue speakers. First, Paul was not commending any form of gibberish since he'd already established a real gift consisted of speaking in translatable foreign languages. Do, are, are we in agreement there? That whatever Paul was talking about, he was talking about language. He was talking about German, French, Swahili. He wasn't talking about, how is it, man? That. He wasn't talking about that. Are, do we, are we in agreement there? That's what you find in the Bible. That's Acts chapter 2. That's 1 Corinthians 12. Okay? Second. Uh, the last paragraph at 150. Second, Paul would never extol prayers that bypass the mind. Paul would never encourage prayers that bypass your mind. Can you pray without your mind? Have you ever tried to pray real long when you go to bed at night and you keep falling asleep? Now, I've heard myself pray while I was asleep, but I wasn't really saying anything. When my kids were little, we used to read to them all the time. And uh, when I'd lie in bed and I'd read, uh, invariably I'd fall asleep pretty quick by page two. And... <laughs> I'd be reading, and just about every single time, it was cute because I, I'm reading, and you know, I could feel myself nodding off, you know, and I'm still reading because it's so important, and then I'd hear myself reading, or I'd hear somebody reading, <laughs> nonsense. I was just making up words, and I'd, I'd open my eyes, and my kids are just looking over me because <laughs> they knew I was asleep. I was not talking in my sleep. I was pretending to read. I don't know what I was doing, but you know, you, you just kind of on autopilot, except I was crashing and burning. I was just saying words, right? Um, prayer is not supposed to bypass your mind. Prayer is an intellectual, spiritual exercise. It's spiritual because it's connected to God, but you're connecting to God with intellectual concepts constructs, words. So prayer that bypasses the mind is silliness like me reading to my kids when I was asleep. 
Paul would never encourage prayers that bypass the mind, as many charismatics do. That was and still is today a pagan practice. In the Greco-Roman Greco mystery religions, ecstatic utterances were commonly employed as a way to circumvent the mind in order to commune with a demonic entity. So it is likely that Paul's words in these verses include a sarcastic tone. I think Paul was sarcastic a lot, especially with the, the Corinthians, because they were just so full of themselves. I mean, Paul said at one point, oh yeah, you're, you're all grown up. Oh yeah, we're all gods, he said in another, and he just kind of, eh. um, In the Greco-Roman mystery religions, uh, ecstatic utterances commonly employed to bypass the mind to speak to demons. Likely that Paul's words included a sarcastic tone as he rebuked the Corinthian Christians for their attempt to imitate the mindless practices of their pagan neighbors. Uh, jump down about four lines. The proper use of the gift always involved both the spirit and the mind. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the understanding. Third, Paul's prayer spoke here was a public prayer, not some form of private devotion. Remember, he's talking about going on in, this is going on in church. Verse 16 makes it clear that the others in the church were listening to what was being said. So Paul was referring to a prayer in the church that needed to be translated so the congregation could affirm that the message and uh, be edified by the contents. So the prayer here is in tongues. Okay, fine. It's a prayer in German and somebody needs to translate it, that's not, oh, I have the gift of interpretation. What he's saying is, no, oh, I speak German. I'm the interpreter because I'm the one who needs to hear it in German. Does that make sense? If God gives me the spiritual gift of speaking in Spanish, well, that would only be because somebody here needs to hear it in Spanish. Yo quiero Taco Bell. And somebody out there says, me too. Me o tu o. That's Spanish. The interpreter is not a third person. The interpreter, I mean, the interpreter is not someone who, who, the interpreter is not what you see in charismatic churches today. The interpreter is the person you're talking to. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that God's word will never come back void. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's good. Yeah. If, some, if someone is unconscious or in a coma and you, you don't know how responsive they are, is it okay to have the Bible playing on cassette or the nanny or Ned and Stacy, anything to stimulate my thinking? Yeah, I, I used to tell Lauren that if I'm ever out in the hospital, I, I, we love watching reruns of the nanny and Ned and Stacy. I'm that spiritual. <laughs> and uh, they just make me laugh. They're mindless. And, and while we're getting ready for bed, I'm watching the nanny. Ah! We know them by heart. I know all the dialogues. I know what Nanny's going to say. I know what Niles is going to say. I know how she's going to laugh. I, I just love it. It's just mindless. I think probably better to have Bible stuff going through, you know, have the TV going uh, when in, in hospital situations, when praying for someone that you're, you're not sure where they are, you know, if they're conscious, if they're, if they're I, I, yeah, I'll get up next to them and I'll pray. You know, I get up close to their ear, so I'm not, oh, you know, and I'll scream out loud. But, uh, yeah, I, I will get it, because who knows that God will open, yeah? The reason I, the reason I asked you only was because yeah. you said earlier, you know, you just got to be a, yeah. uh, you know, on a, on a consciousness level, but yeah. I didn't think it was, I thought that it would be a good Well, yeah, of course, yeah, of course. Um, you know, I've talked to people who would, fall, I preach to people who are asleep all the time. I hope when they wake up, <laughs> they'll, they'll hear something. Some of what I teach may be getting through, you know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not against that. I'm just saying that when we pray, it's not supposed to bypass my mind. If I'm praying and it's not going through my mind, that, that's a problem, okay? Uh, jump down to 151, middle of the page. Uh, did Paul practice a private form of tongues? Charismatics often point to 1 Corinthians 14, 18 to argue that Paul himself employed a private prayer language. Paul stated, I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Now, if the starting point is what we know tongues is, then what was he saying? Praise the Lord, I speak in what? Uh, Hebrew, German, English, Swahili, Norwegia, ease. Yeah. I, I spoke in a language, not gibberish, right? Again, your starting point is really important. What, what, is, what does the Bible actually say? I thank my God that I speak with languages more than you all. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words in 
Hebrew or English or Spanish, whatever, whatever the congregation speaks, that I may teach others also rather than 10,000 words in a language they don't understand. Because Paul did not specify when or where he spoke in languages, the charismatic claim that Paul cultivated a private prayer language is an invention built on sheer speculation. I agree. Because if Paul is speaking under inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he says tongues is a spiritual gift and the spiritual gift is given to him for someone else and that's supposed to be exercised in the church, then he, whatever it was, it can't be prayer language. It, it just can't be because that's n not what he was teaching. Does that make sense? Based on that precedent, it's best to conclude that Paul used this gift in the same missionary way as a sign that authenticated his apostolic ministry. Okay. Um, we can stop here, uh, and we can we can meet one more week if you guys want to. You want to do that? And what we'll do is 155, fake healings and false hopes. And next week will kind of be a catch-all for everything, but we'll deal with page 155 through 176. Um, what about healings? If if I have people, I've had people tell me in church all the time, uh, they read about, they heard about, uh, someone in Africa uh, uh, raising people from the dead. Uh, uh, people in uh, in uh, on mission fields who are uh, <coughs> causing blind eyes to see. Um, uh, people who are maimed and halt are being healed. Um, what do I do with that? Well, in our next four minutes, first of all, what do you think I do with that? What do I do with testimonies? Same thing I do with commercials. Enjoy them. Laugh at them. Hmm. Think about them. But a testimony, while it could be very, very persuasive, testimonies don't prove anything. Commercials don't prove anything. Stories from Africa, stories from Benny Hinn's Crusade, stories from Joyce Myers, stories from anybody, any mission field, anywhere, YWAM, uh, bonky, uh, any of them, any of them, anybody you like, anybody you trust, Southern Baptist Convention, Mission Board, it doesn't matter. Testimonies that you hear from all over the country about these miraculous things being done, maybe they happened, maybe they did, but why do they happen over there where people tend to be more superstitious and gullible than here? Hmm. Hmm. Why do those kinds of things tend to happen in South Valley kinds of churches? rather than Northeast Heights kinds of churches. I'm treading on dangerous, bigoted territory here. People who come, uh, my experience has been, uh, I, 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 I have a ministry in the desert Southwest. Okay, I, if you don't know that, I live in Albuquerque in the Southwest Valley. People who come out of Catholic churches, but not a lot out of Catholic churches, they come out of the Catholic church, but not, you know, they get still got one foot in. They bring a lot of that attitude, a lot of that, that fear with them. People who come out of a superstitious religion tend to look for another religion that's kind and not too scary, another superstitious religion. Most Catholics who say they get saved and get into Christian ministries in our neck of the woods, they're most comfortable going from a Catholic church to a charismatic church. They're more comfortable going Catholic to Charismatic than they are going Catholic to Baptist. Why would that be? Well, first of all, we're mean. And just check it out. Test my hypothesis. Look around and see if that's not the case. People who come out of Catholic churches, but not really. I mean, they come out, but, you know, I mean, they don't stand against everything like I do. You know, I came out. I, I came out. Well, that's, that's when you tell everybody you're gay, right? So not that one. I, I, I never actually left the Catholic Church, but I'm telling you today, I disagree with virtually everything the Catholic Church teaches. Well, I, I disagree with everything the Catholic Church teaches that's outside of the Bible. Okay? Uh, my experience has been, and, and just test it out. People who come out of Catholic churches into Christian, I'm making that quote there, who go into Christian churches, they tend to be more comfortable going into charismatic churches than they do going into Baptist churches. Because charismatic churches tend to feed on that superstition. That supernatural mumbo-jumbo that you really can't prove or disprove. They came out of a very, uh, uh, I was going to say matriarchal, what do you, where, the, where, the, where the preacher is very, uh, 
uh, and it's not patriarchal, but very, uh, huh? You know, the, the preacher just says it and you just, you just believe it. You just do it. Authoritarian, right? And, and while Baptist churches tend to be very authoritarian, dictatorial, not even benevolent, um, charismatic churches, they, they, they really do feed on it. Uh, many of these guys pray, P-R-E-Y. They take advantage of, of people who are sensitive, sensitive, good, sensitive, but maybe not that deep in truth, and so tend to be a little gullible. I find legacy is full of uh, a certain mindset. Sorry, legacy. Calvary is full of a mindset. Calvary's more Northeast Heights kind of legacy, but it's the same ilk. They're, they're charismatic. Um, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know, what do I have, 60 seconds, not even? I'm going to go by this clock in front of me, not that one back there. I don't know, charismatics, I mean, people who say they're, they're charismatic and they're Baptist in the spirit and they hear voices and they speak in tongues and they just, if they did their jobs the way they do their faith, they could not keep their job. There's no responsibility. There's no accountability. There's no way to evaluate. Uh, just, just chew on it. Just, just take it with you, to, to, to you know, it's as a, as a working hypothesis. You can't just float through life glibly, do -do 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 -do, and not make decisions or make stupid decisions and keep your job. You can't, unless you've got a goof, filthy rich boss who doesn't care. You can't make decisions like that. In business, you have to evaluate. There is a bottom line. There is a profit side of the ledger and a loss side of the ledger. People of faith need to be the same way. There's a profit and loss side. This is the indicator, not how close you feel to Jesus. God's, the, this truth, what this says, is, is, is the bottom line. Not how you feel about your faith how close you are. I don't care what people disagree with me, but disagree with me on, on Bible terms, not just because you disagree with me because that made you feel better. You know what I mean? So um, I, I don't think people in a charismatic church are, I think people who come out of, I think people, I got saved while I was a Catholic. In the Catholic church, I found out I was a sinner. Jesus is God, died for my sins, was buried, rose from the dead. That's the truth. And that's the truth. But beyond that, I was also taught that I have to be baptized to have my sins washed away. I couldn't get saved outside of the Catholic Church. Well, those, those go against these. So where you have these, that's the Bible, and then church teaching that you have to be saved in the Catholic Church, and that the, the, the baptism washes sins away, where those clash, guess which ones Catholics believe? the traditions of the church. In charismatic churches, they have the Bible and their experience. Just as dangerous. I spoke in tongues. I was slain in the Holy Spirit. I know in my knower what God is telling me right now. All of that is out here. Not this, but out here. It's not this. It's not the Bible. It's their subjective experience. So, I'm through. Jesus teaches girl as amen.